So um, I'm going to be rec I'm recording the meeting now. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. There's 30 people attending. That's pretty good. That's actually um, well, that, that's more than half of people who come to class. So that's good. Um, all right. So I'm going to switch the camera now so that I can write on the page and you guys can see it. I'll be doing some stuff in the bracket window, which you see over here. And um, and then there'll be points where, um, you know, I'll give you guys some prompts to work on and then we'll be continuing. Um, anyone who is, uh, like, connected with voice, please feel free to ask questions anytime, just like, just like in class. Um, any, actually, any questions before we start? Before I, I start my lecture presentation. Um, do you want us to just vocalize, ask questions, or do you want us to like raise a hand and chat kind of thing? Or? Yeah, just just shout out um, Giuseppe because I won't be looking at the chat. So like certainly if you want to type something, you can, and then if I notice it, I'll respond to it. Or if someone notices that I'm not noticing it, you could ask me to respond to it. Or you guys can also talk to each other on chat. That's fine too. Um, but yeah, please feel free to just jump in. So you can unmute yourself and jump in. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Right, let's get I'm, I'm going to move the camera so it's going to be discombobulated for a minute. Okay, so um, can you guys see that okay? Yes. Great. Um, okay, so today we're going to introduce what's called the environment model. of procedure application. And, um, and this is much more, this is actually what's going on. So this is going to replace the substitution model that we have been using. So the substitution model, we got a lot of mileage out of it. And actually, it's still good for many things, like looking at recursions. So like, don't throw away the substitution model. Um, but the environment model is a much more accurate description of what Scheme is doing. Um, and furthermore, if looking at the trajectory of the class, there, the second to last unit is we're going to actually be building Scheme. It, um, we're going to be building our own Scheme interpreter. So we will actually be implementing this environment model that um, I'll be introducing today. Um, we're going to introduce two new um, primitives. So we're going to be introducing set bang. It, the actual keyword is set exclamation point, and it's pronounced set bang. And this allows mutation. So again, up until this point in the class, um, it's been a pure functional model. Um, we're now like violating that. We're going to look at we're going to look at how to build objects and object with state. So Scheme is, is a, a hybrid environment. It allows state and mutation. Um, so we're going to be, for, for now, we're going to be embracing um, mutation. And that's actually the word that's used when you describe changing state. It's, I think it's intentionally chosen, chosen to be like a, a like evocative word, um, state mutation. And the exclamation point is like the reason the primitive name includes an exclamation point is to highlight to you as the programmer and other people who read your code that you are mutating state. So that's what the, the and in general, state mutation in Scheme, the primitive names have exclamation point. Um, the other primitive that I'm going to introduce today is begin. And what begin, and this, this sort of, it goes hand in hand with the mutation thing. What begin does is it allows you to take a series of expressions and make it into a single expression. And that's typically done with state modification because you'll change some state and you know, then you change some more state and then 
you'll change some more state, and then you're done. So those things go together. Um, so the example I'm going to use builds on the example in the book, um, and we're going to we're going to make these like um, simulated bank accounts. Um, but first, I'm going to um, but first I'm going to actually just describe the environment model. So um, you've heard me talk about um, um, define, and I think I described define as something like makes a binding from a symbol to a value. in an environment. You can look up on the web page, but I'm not going to do that now. Something like this. That's what Define does. So now let's actually draw that. So, um, and you might have, you might have, I might have talked about the global environment. So when you first launch Scheme, you get a thing called the global environment, and a bunch of stuff is already exists in there, and when you type Define, more things get created in there. So I'm just going to draw. We draw environments as rectangles. Um, so imagine this is a global environment and now I'm going to run some code. I'm going to say define foo to be free. So now let's actually draw that idea of um, the symbol foo being bound to a value in the environment. So we've got the global environment. I'm just going to write the symbol name foo here, and I'll say colon, and it's bound to three. So that's to illustrate like the symbol foo existing in the global environment bound to the value three. Um, now I'm going to introduce how we draw pr procedures using this model. So let's say we are to define, we're going to make the square procedure, so we'll call it sq. And I'm going to use the lambda formulation to make it more obvious that the procedure is being defined or created. Okay. Um, all right. So we, we, we run this line of code. That happens. Now we evaluate this line of code. Let's draw the way a procedure is represented. So there's two parts to a procedure. There's a left part and a right part. It, it gets drawn in the book, there's two circles like for the two parts. The left part points to the procedures okay. The procedures um, parameters and the procedure's body. Eh, hold on a second, guys. You're off screen. I know. Mm -hmm. Almost reaches the bottom. I was trying to... Okay. So the parameters of this body, uh, of this procedure, are just the... It just has one parameter, N. And the body is what the procedure will evaluate when it runs. So pretty much it's always like a single expression. I mean, I, I like I don't know if that's been quite evident, but all the procedures we're writing are single expressions. And we're, that's like fundamentally true that the body, I mean, it might be very complicated. And now that we have this begin that we'll start using, that could mean it does a series of things. But ultimately, it's a single expression that gets evaluated. So that's the first part of the story. The second part of the story is the procedure exists in the context of an environment. And we're going to see how this matters as we move forward. But for now, um, the, the, this procedure is cre it, 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 it's what environment was created within. So this procedure, we imagine at top level, it was created within the context of the global environment. So it has this like frame pointer that goes back to the environment in which it was created. So if we were to just type in at top level, like lambda um, 
Put my hands in the water when I want to show. If we were to just type this, lambda of n times nn, this thing would get created, and then as we've seen, it would immediately disappear with garbage collected. But we bound it to this new symbol sq. So that symbol gets created, define creates the symbol, and then sq gets bound to this procedure object. So that's the way we draw what just happened here. So far, so good. All right, so I'm going to bring this to the top of the page and get a new page. Hmm. Wait, why does that not show up? That's odd. Something just shifted with my paper. Okay, so there we've, we've defined foo, it's value 3, we've created a procedure and bound it to the label, the, um, the symbol sq. Now, the next thing we want to do is what happens when we apply the procedure. So this is where um, we have a new model that's no longer the substitution model. So suppose we were to say sq of 5, what is going to happen? So the, the answer is, if you just think about it, we need an environment where this 5 will get bound to the parameter of the procedure so that the body can run. The body needs to evaluate, it needs to look up n, just intuitively, n needs to get bound to 5 in order for this to, to happen. So here's how it works. When procedure application occurs, a new frame gets created. That frame links back to the frame in which the application occurred. So we're, we're matching this at top level. So this frame links back to there. In the frame, the bindings occur. So we look at the parameters of this procedure. So we, we know that um, when, you know, when, when the application occurs, we've got this whole procedure object. We can look at what its parameters are named. We see here that it has one parameter and it's going to be named n. There's that parameter, it's a 5. So we bind n to 5. And in the context of this frame, we evaluate the body. So times nn gets evaluated in the context of that frame. So, um, the, the, so then when we evaluate n, we're like, okay, let's look Let's look up in our environment. Okay, n5. So that gets replaced with 5. That gets replaced with 5. It multiplies and returns to 25. Um, the um, part of this model is that inside the body of the procedure, it has access to things that are defined in the whole chain of environment frames. So if it was looking up a symbol and it didn't exist in the innermost frame, it would walk its way up the frame chain, and it would look up in this frame. That's the end of the line. Once you the global environment, there aren't any more. Um, so it, then it would start looking in the global environment for to figure out what the symbol is bound to. Um, and it, it walks its way up. And if it gets all the way to the top and it still doesn't find it, then you get the undefined error. Um, so that's part of the model that we didn't realize until now. This is called lexical scoping. Um, we'll we'll look at this more later. I, I, I'm not going to like dive into like, the other version is called dynamic scoping. I'm not going to unpack that in detail right now, but we'll look at that later. But the thing that we have is called lexical scoping. Just looking up the um, the chain. Of, and it has to do with the, the environment order is based on the way things were defined. Um, okay. So, mm -hmm. he, yeah, go ahead. So, is this why when we define some, like a helper function like iter um, inside of a function, and we may use iter more than one time, it doesn't confuse what environment it's in? Yes, that's right. 
Right. So if you have a procedure and inside of it you define a procedure, that procedure gets defined only inside the frame of the procedure that created it. Yeah. So and and so it acts like a local variable, which is what you want in that case. Yep. Um, okay. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna write some code to illustrate this idea, just to demonstrate that this like walking up the chain actually exists. I'm gonna go over to um, the bracket buffer. Um, so we're gonna define foo to be three. Can you guys see that okay? Mm, yeah. Like is the, is the font big enough that you can see it? Yeah, the font looks good. Okay. It looks good to me. Okay. Um, I'm on a computer, so. Yeah, if you're on a phone, you have to really squint. Okay, so we're going to make this procedure add foo, and um, it will take a parameter. And then, uh, this is just a simple example. Um, then what it's going to do is it's going to add to its parameter the value foo, which only exists at, at top level. So here we go. And now if we say add foo of 5, it's perfectly happy. So it, it, when this line of code ran and it was trying to find out what's foo, and actually, you can see here with the syntax highlighted that this foo is that one. Um, so that's part of this, this, like this lexical scoping is that you can figure this out just by looking at the source code, what's linked to what. So if this were commented out, then that foo doesn't exist. And right, even, even at top level, we know that, that that foo doesn't exist. Um, okay, so that's the setup. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to introduce um, this bank account thing. And first, we're going to do it the like we're we're going to do it without objects. We're just going to do it at, at um, using the global environment to make things, and then we're going to extend that code. Okay, so we're going to define a, um, a, a symbol called balance, which will hold the balance of our bank account. Let's get started at zero. Um, we're going to make a procedure that adds to the balance. And so it's, it's going to be just like that add to thing that I So we'll call it add funds. And take an amount. So here I'm going to introduce begin because I want to do two things. I want to actually add the funds and then I want to return the new balance. So I'm going to say begin. And now we're going to see the first use of set bang. So set bang. Um, it rebinds an existing symbol. So the symbol must already exist to use set bang, and then it reassigns it to a new a new value. So we're we're going to set balance to be the we're going to add the funds. So the result of the current so this is just like n equals m plus one sort of code that we have not been doing at all this semester, but we're starting to do it now. Okay, so we're going to add balance and the, the amount of new money, and then we'll, we'll, we'll modify balance. Um, and then the second line of the begin statement is um, we're just going to ask for what balance is. So the rule for begin is it does, it does however many things you, you want in sequence, and then this begin is still an expression. And so an expression must have a value, and the value of a begin expression is the value of the last thing. So this, this one actually does the work, and then this one reports the new value of balance. Because that's the whole procedure. 
Okay, that's the add funds. Now we're going to um, we're going to make a procedure for withdrawing funds. So we have to make sure that the funds are there. So we're going to use an if statement. Um, so as long as after we withdraw the money, this won't actually do it. This is just the test. If the amount of money minus the amount of money we have minus the amount we want to withdraw is greater than zero, then we're going to go ahead and do it. And we're going to do this begin thing again. So the first statement will actually do the subtraction. And then the second line of begin will report the new balance. And it's an if statement, so we have the else case. If we can't do that, we're going to return an error, and it's going to be of a symbol insufficient funds. And that's the whole story with the thought. Um, okay. Do you guys want to see this running to see that it works? Sure, we'll do that. I've already lived it up. Okay, here it is. Okay, so we'll start off. Our, our balance is zero right now. So we can inspect our balance just by saying, what's the value of that symbol? We can add funds. We'll add $50. Now we have fifty dollars. We can withdraw ten dollars. Now we have forty. Thirty dollars. Now we have ten. And if we try to withdraw twenty at this point, we can't. And those funds were not withdrawn, so balance should still be ten. Okay. So it works. Um, so here's the first exercise. What I would like you guys to do is using the environment model, I'm going to put it back on the screen so you'll have both the code and the environment model. I want you guys to draw what happens when these three, these three things are defined. So draw what the world looks like at the point of those things, like when I hit F5. What does the world look like right now? Does everybody understand the problem? Could you please repeat that? Yeah. So I, I want you to make a drawing that's comparable to this, that represents the world of these three definitions. So. Thank you. We, yeah. So I mean, in the global environment, there's going to be like three things that are defined in it, um, and I want. Like I want the drawing with as much as much detail as you can, like based on this one. So let's like let's take a few minutes and then we'll debrief.
Hey, I just wanted to let you know, like, so when you draw the, when you write, write down the body of the procedure, when we were doing, like, the times and then, it's sort of like, there's not that much to do. These bodies are kind of long, so you can abbreviate the bodies. For example, like you could say, if it started with begin, you could say begin, dot, 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 or the one that starts with the F, just so that you're not like literally copying the entire procedure into the drawing. That, that's not what I wanted. Um, how are people doing? Why, why isn't everybody like key in a message like done or still working or something else? All right, a lot of people, most people are done. All right, let's debrief. Okay, so we'll start out by drawing the global environment. Often, um, I will abbreviate this as GE, global environment. Um, okay, so we define balance to be zero. So we create a symbol named balance, and it's bound to the value zero. Next, we define a procedure called add funds. So let's draw the procedure first. So it has the two circles, the right circle points back to the frame in which it was created. Um, so that's going to point back to the global environment. By the way, that this explains um, the local procedure thing. Then it would point back to the frame of the procedure application. That's what makes it like contained within the procedure. Um, OK, it has a parameter named n, we're doing add funds, and it has a body that starts with begin. And then we define, we create that procedure and bound it to a symbol in the global environment that's called add funds. This arrow can point to like anywhere. It doesn't matter like if it points to there or there. It doesn't. It just points to this like object. So that's the add funds procedure. Um, similarly, there is um, it is going to be withdraw procedure. That one also was created in the global environment. It also has a one parameter named n. It has a body. That starts with F. And that got called withdraw. So again, this arrow is not pointing to the left half. It's pointing to the whole thing. I just drew it over there. Um, so there it is. Do people have that? Any any questions yes. on this?
Okay, so we're going to take this example one step further. What I'd like you to do now is draw what happens when we evaluate the expression add funds of 10. What, like what happens during and what does the thing look like at the end? So what does that look like? And remember, I'm going to put back on the screen. Um, I'll leave that up. And I'm going to add this. I don't know if it doesn't fit. I'm going to actually, so I'm going to just put back what we had before to help you with this. So we're going to do add funds of 10. And this is the help. This is what we did before. Yeah, that's what you need to say. Okay, so modify your existing drawing for evaluating that expression. We'll take like two minutes to do that, or something like that. Oh, I could do this. Yeah, now you guys can see pretty much everything. Are people done? Yes. Okay. So let's draw this one out. So Procedure application means a new frame gets created for where the parameters of the procedures are bound. And in that context, um, the body is, is evaluated. So, okay, we're going we're gonna to go to add, um, we're going to go to add funds, which I think, Um, actually, I think, I think I might have misspoke. Oh no, something broke. My screen, do you guys, did my video just die? We still see your video, but there's like an error message. Yeah, it's like crossed out. Oh, let me restart the app. It's back. Okay, good. Let me this out of the way. Okay, we're evaluating. I'm going to draw it up here. Add funds of 10. Um, okay, so we look to see where the procedure, uh, where the procedure points back to, and that's where this frame points back to. So this frame, it gets, it's, I think I misspoke previously. Um, this frame gets its upward frame pointer from the procedure itself. So it looks at that procedure and says this procedure goes back to the global environment. So that's where this one goes back to. And then, and then in that context, the procedure body gets, the procedure's parameter gets defined. So n gets bound to 10. And then in this context, the body evaluates. So the begin statement. And so the begin statement ultimately re results in set bang, 
of balance to be balance plus 10. So the current balance is 0. Right. Plus balance 10. Well, plus balance n. So then these these two these two symbols have to be looked up. So n gets looked up and the value's right there. So it gets replaced with 10. Balance gets looked up. It's not in this frame, but then it climbs its way to the global environment and balance does exist there. That gets replaced with zero. So 10 and zero get added to produce a 10. And then the set bang evaluates and it sets Again, it looks for where where is balance. It's not here. It's there. So then this gets changed to 10. So we've modified the, um, the global environment. And then the, the, the next line to begin is looking up balance. So it walks its way back, finds that balance is 10, and that's what gets returned. Um, so this procedure has access to state in the global environment because the procedure was created in the context of the global environment. Um, so that's the end of this demo, um, this particular one. What, what's, the, uh, what's the main issue with this, with like, would we want to like really write code like this? What, what's the like limitation of this sort of code? Well, it's not very modular, right? We're creating, we have one balance. I mean, it's like this is, you know, I'm sure you guys were told never create globals, right? So this is like a global variable. These procedures can only work on that one. So if you wanted to have two accounts, we'd need like two copies of the procedures. That, I mean, that's annoying. We could have this thing be some sort of like compound object, like a list. But it's just sort of, it's fundamentally like ugly code in that regard. So the main point of going through this was to show that the procedure has access to the global environment. But we can do something much more elegant. So that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to get a new page. So this is the beginning of using um, using scheme to make objects. So this is going to be like the, the, the sort of object version of the same idea. Okay. So we're going to define a procedure that we call make account. And this will make us like this will make us a procedure object that contains the balance. This is this is the cool part. So it will have an initial balance. Um, Inside the context of this procedure, we define and return another procedure that, um, that does withdrawals. So all, right now, all this one can do, we'll extend it later, all this one can do is remove money from your account. <laughs> um, and it will take a parameter. And then it's... Um, it's that same if statement that we saw before. But what you'll see is it works differently. So if we have the money, then we do the set thing. And then return the new balance. Otherwise, we say insufficient funds. Okay. So it turns out this one's different. Um, let me show you it running, and then I'm going to ask you guys to draw it. So I want to show you what it looks like to use it, and then, yeah, I guess I'll draw it. Oops. No, not that one. Yeah, here it is. Um, okay, so, oh, it's supposed to be called make withdraw.
And so all it can do is withdraw from the initial balance. Okay, so now that's going to return, this is going to return a procedure. And we need to hold on to that procedure in order to do stuff. So um, we're going to say like Fred's account will be make withdraw. I'll start off with $100. Okay, so now what is this Fred's thing? It's a procedure. By the way, if you've saved the file, this tells you where the procedure is. It's like line four, column two, which is right here. You can see down at the bottom of the screen. I don't know if you can see this tiny four, column two. So this is a scheme racket being helpful and saying it's a procedure and it's that one. So it's this lambda object. So in order to use it, we have to apply it to an amount. So I want to withdraw $10. And then, OK, you have $9 left. If we do it again, now you have $80. That's a good question. Sorry, I missed that. Um, that's fine. So I was just wondering, and looking at your record code versus the code you wrote on paper, there's a greater minus balance amount. And is that a zero there? Is a, I was just curious what that was doing. Oh, it looks like I can't actually withdraw all the money. Or I can in the, the version that's in the code buffer. But the version that I wrote here, it would say no. You know, zero is not greater than zero. You can't have all $80. I'd have to leave, like, some money in the account. Yeah, that should be, you know, if we want to be able to, if we want to be able to, like, remove all our money, then we need the equal sign. Hmm. But I guess I was more wondering about the zero at the so it's a minus and imbalance amount and is that a zero or Oh, what did I do wrong here? Thank you. Yep. Oh I see. The code is slightly different. Yeah. The code in the buffer is from the book. Okay, now now I think it does the same thing now. Um Cheers. By the way, n notice that this is clear evidence that this is not functional programming. Because in functional programming, if you evaluate a function with a parameter, it should always produce the same value. So it's not, right? It's clearly there's hidden state. Um, OK, so this thing works. So why don't you guys draw this? Draw this using the environment diagram. I think this one will be a little bit more interesting than the one we just did. I'll put the other one back up on the screen. And I'll actually, you don't need to see the written version. You can look at the typed version. So that's what we did before. Make a new drawing based on this one. Actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to add to the problem, like, not only do that, but include in your drawing this define. Yeah, so draw that.
Okay, let me um, let me debrief it. We'll have a minute to talk. So this one is the, this one's interesting. Okay, so start off with the global environment. Um, okay, so we're going to define make withdraw. So what, when we're done, we'll have a symbol called make withdraw. It's going to point to something. What's it going to point to? It's well, it's a procedure. That procedure was created in the global context. Um, what is what is the parameter of the procedure? It's a it's called balance. And what's the body of the procedure? The body of the procedure is a lambda. Okay, and make withdraw is bound to that. So, okay, so far not very exciting. The exciting part is the next step. Um, so now we're going to define Fred's to be something. And it's going to be a procedure application of make withdraw. So for procedure application, a frame gets created where the parameters of the procedure are bound to concrete values. So the parameter of this procedure is balance. And the value it gets bound to is 100. In this case, we're doing make withdraw of 100. This frame links back to the frame that the procedure was, was created in. So it's going to link back to the global frame. Then, in the context of this frame, this procedure runs. Um, sorry, the body runs. The body of the procedure runs. The body of the procedure makes a procedure. So we evaluate this lambda statement, the lambda of amount. So that creates a new procedure. Um, I'm going to draw it over here. Um, that procedure was created in the context of this frame. That procedure has parameters that are named um, amount. That procedure has a body that is an if statement. And then Here's the magic. This is the interesting part, is that procedure is the thing that's returned by evaluating make withdraw. So make withdraw, when make withdraw evaluates, it gets a frame created for its evaluation with this binding of its parameter to a value. It makes a procedure. That procedure is what gets returned. So Fred's gets bound to this procedure. So this is this is where then the thing that is like um, like an object member variable is created. So because this procedure is connected to this frame, has access to this frame, and and also because this procedure is bound to something of the global environment, the procedure doesn't get does not get garbage collected. The frame doesn't get garbage collected, and this collection, in this case, these two things, the procedure and the frame that was created for its evaluation, it was created for, um, it was created for the evaluation of make withdraw, but got attached to this procedure. That union is called a closure. And because of the closure, this procedure now has captive access to this balance. The only thing in the world that can touch this balance um, binding is this procedure. So then when we, uh, when we evaluate the procedure by saying like Fred's of 10, then we're able to like modify that balance and do whatever we want. To. So this is the big idea um, with procedures and um, the environment model is that you can create these closure objects where the things are tied together 
and also they can persist and have private access. So this procedure has private access to the stuff in this frame. Does that make sense? From a historical standpoint, the thing that's, that's fascinating is that like this language was invented in the late 1950s with these capabilities. And it wasn't until like, the 70s into the 80s that people started thinking about programming like this and effectively prototyping the ideas for what became like our now canonical object-oriented programming. Um, but here, they, here it is. So all this stuff was prototyped and not exclusively, but a lot of the ideas were worked out in the scheme world before they became you know, widespread in languages like C++. Um, so we're out of time. I think uh, I, I, we take a question. Is there any questions or um, or chat questions or what do people think? Okay, Josh is asking, is this going to be posted? Um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to post it on YouTube because I can do that right away. Ultimately, we'll go to Echo 360, but I'll post it to YouTube and um, and send an email around once it's there. Great, thanks everyone. Um, thanks for participating, and see you guys on Wednesday. Bye everyone.